the basic gist of rhetoric, right? I think you said it's a it's a turning toward the other. Mm-hmm. Right? The I really and the other could be nothing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's so it's this turning toward, right? Right. But then what happens when the nothing is addressing you? Thank you for tuning in to Circling into Dialogos and my conversation with Drew Kopp. More about that conversation with Drew in a moment, which was awesome. But first, some housekeeping. If you are interested in coaching with me one-on-one, what you want to do is just go ahead and email me. My email is below in the show notes. And just let me know that you're interested and what will happen is I'll get back to you and we'll schedule an initial consultation session and see if it's a fit. Also, if you are interested in taking the, the, the inspirations, the ideas that we discuss on this channel and want to enact them, not just think about them, but live them in your life and practice doing that with, with other people in fellowship, Um, The Circling Institute, my company, uh, offers many possibilities for you to participate and go deeper. Um, We have a a Thursday drop-in event, we have weekend courses, and we have year-long trainings. All the links for that are below in the show notes. Okay, so my conversation with with Drew was really awesome. So Drew is a he's an author. He wrote the book Speaking Being, or co- co-authored the book Speaking Being. He's a philosopher, a teacher, and just a really really great guy. Um, I'm I'm enjoying getting to know him, and I look forward to to more of that. But I want to say that you know I think that his book Speaking Being. And what Drew's attention is on, both in that book and in his work that he he calls ontological inquiry, really zeroes in in a at at the in in my view an intersection that's really quite rare. And I would say that it's rare to have like real rigorous philosophical, especially Heideggerian rigorous philosophical. Um, discussion and ideas coexist with something like personal development. Usually, like you have books about personal development, it's, you know, it's a book about personal development. And if it involves philosophy, it's kind of watered down or something like this. However, in his book, Speaking Being, right, I would say that that on one hand you have this um, transcript of of Warner Earhart speaking alongside um, this this really intense discussion, like r- rigorous, pretty deep discussion about Heidegger that run parallel in the book. And so you get this you get this weaving or this this kind of conversation, if you will, um, between Heidegger's ideas and and existentialist ideas and in some sense, living your actual everyday life. It's really rare that those two things come together, that in my view, in my understanding. So I'm, I'm really interested in that. Um, and so we, we go, we discuss like deeply into his work. We talk about his work in rhetoric. I learned a lot about rhetoric and I think I just like, just tapped the beginning, the beginning of a, of a very deep well with that. So I hope you enjoyed the conversation. I most certainly did. All right. Thanks again for tuning in. Three. Welcome, Drew. I am super... I've really been looking forward to this conversation with you. Yeah, me too. Yeah. So so we met through uh, a friend of mine, um, 
Joan Bordeaux, who I've had actually on, on the podcast before. And she, mm-hmm. uh, she said that, you know, she was like, you guys have got to talk. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, right. And, Cause she, she understands me and all of my interests in like Heidegger and philosophy and all those kinds of things. And, and she's like, like, you know, I need, I need you to have somebody else to talk to, not just me. So let me, <laughs> let me, let me introduce you. <laughs> and, um, and I've also read, mm-hmm. I've also read your book, which we're going to probably talk a lot about um, called speaking being right. Which you co-authored with, with um, essentially uh uh, Warner Earhart, uh, and oh no no no, uh, co-authored with Bruce Hyde. Bruce Hyde, Bruce Hyde yeah. is uh, he um, who passed away in 2015. Yeah. But we completed the book before that, um, and uh, uh, so it's about Warner Earhart. It's, it's about uh, Warner speaking Earhart, being yeah. Warner Earhart, Martin Heidegger, and a new possibility uh, yeah. of of human being you know, for human being. So. Uh, over four, you know, it depends on, on which way you take it, but yeah. And I have to say, I have in, in reading it, I just really personally appreciated because I, I mean, I, like a lot, a lot of the people listening kind of have been grappling with Heidegger for a long time, you know, and that's kind of what you got to do with Heidegger is really wrestle, um, with, with these ideas, right. That, that, that he can't explicitly say, right. But that in some sense, awaken in the background. And, and there's a, I've always had a sense with Heidegger's work that there's real relevance and like, in some sense, how we actually live as human beings, right? In a big way. But it's, Mm -hmm. the struggle has been like, um, there's, I just don't see a lot of work out there that actually correlate that in a, in a direct way, right? The distinctions within Heidegger and how one can live their life in that sense, right. As a, as a person, um, Hmm. a lot of, a lot of the work is pretty, I mean, really, really high level academia, but there's something about this work, right. That, you know, and it's, it's tracking alongside a conversation with Werner Earhart, right. Which is in a, Hmm. in a, in a, in a landmark forum, but what you're, what, what you're doing along with this, and I'll ask you more about this, is like you're also, as as that dialogue, as you're reading that dialogue in the forum, there's there's a, you guys are doing, it's in correlation, a um, a commentary on basically Heidegger's work. Um, mm-hmm. And I keep finding like, I, I was just reading, I was just reading again this morning of just the way that you're making these direct links right to like the clearing and our actual experience in this correlation these connections that you're making that i'm like oh yeah that is really true it just locks it in in, in a more i i don't know a, uh in a more like personally relevant sense um and that's mm-hmm. what i really have appreciated about the book and a, and a whole lot more so mm-hmm. Um, I'd love to have this di- like this dialogue and, and and maybe even get into real dialogos right with you about about the book sure. right um and and but first I'd love I'd love for you to say a few words about just introduce yourself to the audience about what you're up to right now what you've what like a little bit of how you got there um, I know that you've also you've started a like a publication you know all those kinds of things so. Who are you? Sure. So, uh, well, my name is Drew Kopp, um, and that's with a K, not a C. Uh, (laughs) And um, uh, so, you know, just to let you know a little bit about, you know, my background, I was born in uh, in 1970 and um, uh, to very, very middle class parents, working class parents. uh, And um, uh, due to um, uh, getting pneumonia frequently as a baby and being allergic to penicillin, um, my parents were all but ordered to uh, move to Arizona. And so they promptly moved to Florida. And uh, <laughs> so I grew up in Florida. <laughs> I don't know. But uh, but <laughs> so I grew up in Florida and um, <laughs> near the near uh, in the Tampa Bay area and um Went to school at the University of uh, University of South Florida. Uh, majored in English literature uh, around 1993 is when I graduated, and that's when um, 
uh, I encountered the forum, the uh, then uh, the landmark forum, and it was in nineteen actually nineteen ninety two, and uh, I'd already been um, deeply, I'd say, deeply and intensively searching. I would say I I studied very uh, intensively uh, uh, Joseph Campbell, Arthur Schopenhauer, you know. Uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, you know, like this, and 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 discovered um, Gurdjieff and the Fourth Way and Ospensky and J.G. Bennett and and um, <clears throat> and was like looking for a school, you know, like you know whatever. I was man is a machine and all these other things. That I was just sort of, you know, and I was very offended by that at first, you know. <laughs> yeah, but um, but then um, uh, and and even experimented with like rebirthing and and uh and and uh, that sort of business um but when uh i did the forum it was it was just so astounding and shocking that uh this was the first time i had encountered something that wasn't just about whatever it is that i was looking for it provided a direct access to it hmm. and uh and i discovered you know the groundlessness of of my life firsthand mm. that oh my god this is it mm. this is it <laughs> mm. Mm. and and I, I i and i got you know access to the uh what it means to be a person of my word rather than a person of my feelings or my in my opinions or my you know or my car or my family or my girlfriend or whatever but uh which was um a revolution and and uh uh and i invented from that point uh, a new career in film production so i wanted to be a director you know and a writer and director for film and so i started working in film production and just got into action and made it happen and did all kinds of wonderful adventures and uh uh but you know there were there were some uh, I discovered also constraints and barriers that ultimately I was unwilling to do what it would take to get through that. Yeah. And uh, I got married uh, in 99 and then it promptly moved to China. And I lived in China for a year and a half uh, teaching English, business English to uh, Chinese nationals. And, and did after you, about a year that? that, did you just want to move to China for, for the sake of moving to China? <laughs> it's, a, it's a long story, but but, yeah. but we were working on my wife and I were working on a television series in Miami. Okay, and we had a choice. We could have gone on to work in. I was in, in working in the writers' department, working for the the executive producer and and uh, writer for the series that I was. Um, uh, and uh, it was a fabulous, amazing experience. And that was it. That was the trajectory. Go to L.A. now, and you continue. I could have. I could have been a contender. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. but right. but we met somebody who had just come back from china and shared about their experience and and my wife and i barely even we were sitting on different parts of the table and the person was talking and we looked at each other and we knew we were going to china so so we went wow. and that was it wow. and that's the that that went a whole took us to a whole other trajectory and so we were there for a year and then we traveled for six months everywhere but but we spent a lot of time in tibet in both the chinese you know china would say it's all in tibet uh all tibet is in china but but um there's a the tibetan plateau versus what's to the east of that um and uh had an extraordinary time and then uh, uh but then it eventually came home and we were you know it was it was reverse culture just shock just real quick, when in tibet were you were you there in 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 interest of like what people you know, when you think of Tibet and the Buddhism and stuff yeah, like that, was yeah, that yeah, but but or? we were still we were kind of advanced tourists, I would say. In, in other words, I um uh was able to because I'd studied I'd studied stuff. I was sort of like an armchair, you know, um, studier of Tibetan Buddhism, I would say, and um uh and and we did actually have uh, an amazing encounter with a, a reincarnated tolku who was this, actually a student of ours we taught for a, a whole month in this little tibetan town called guza i love i of, love tolku near kangding yeah. and uh, he had like a two two sort of like of his people there was a teacher of tibetan logic and a and what was called a, a former monk who was a naughty monk and they were basically like his protectors huh. And uh, and and he was really actually brilliant. He was a brilliant learner, and delightful. His name was Bo, 
and uh uh and we did have a chance to go um hang out with him for a weekend in his own you know like his own little sort of place and but you know uh, and i did encounter limits like you know i couldn't i couldn't uh he couldn't show me certain things you know even though i was eager to find out you know but uh in any case i uh, uh there's so many little yeah. nooks and crannies of that experience to but um in any case uh we did come back uh had to readjust to american life like intravenously reconnecting to the matrix in a way and uh um and i got that you know part of why we came back was to get higher degrees you know like to 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 get degrees in, in higher ed and uh and so i both both of us applied and got into the university of arizona and i study and i got into something called rhetoric rhetoric composition in the teaching of english is what it's uh the degree that i was uh uh signed up for and i really had no idea what it was <laughs> i just knew i kind of knew Someone had told me, someone I uh, was persuaded of, of this, uh, you'll get a job. Go go do this PhD, you'll get a job. And I was like, okay. And it was a month into this that it dawned on me that, oh my God, what rhetoric was, or at least a hint of it. And I had gotten that I had already been studying rhetoric quite intensively and deeply. So mm. what the heck is rhetoric? Mm. Um, I would say simply, just to get a, a handle uh rhetoric is the study and performance of the event of turning toward the other to address them hmm. and so so hmm. there's the performance of that and then there's the study of that and and the back and forth of of uh, you know of the, the the theory and the practice otherwise called praxis <laughs> Can we just and, say, um, let's say that again because that sounds like the, I've not, I have not heard rhetoric described like that. He said, "Yeah, well, because it's it's a simple, it's a first, it's like an opening salvo because yeah. there's so many other deeper cuts to take. But that, but the first thing to get, it's just there's an event of turning toward the other. Yeah. So what happens when you turn toward the other? Well, one is is that you have to me personally." I've got to give something up. Yes. To turn, I have to relinquish something to turn. And yeah. in the in the turning toward, I become or enter into a relationship with the other. Yeah. And uh and the other then also you know, the thing is is that what if the other isn't interested in turning toward me? How do I how do I address them in such a way that they turn? Yeah, some people call that give marriage. up something. Some what? people call that some people call that marriage. <laughs> well, but that's happening. Interested in turning towards me? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, but that's the though that, that's the concern. Uh, that's a rhetorical concern. You know that any. Um, uh, so hmm. now there's more to it than that, but that's sort of like so. For instance, you know, Aristotle. Uh, hmm provided an interesting definition, an early definition of rhetoric that I think is pretty potent and it has some limits, but it's it's the power to discover the available means of persuasion for a given audience to uh, affect the rhetor's purpose in some way. So uh, so what are you know the available means of persuasion include things like um, all right, well, there's this guy named Guy, you know, and he has an audience uh, of of people that listen, and they have certain ways of reasoning, things that they consider to be valid, valid evidence. And if I'm using what's considered valid evidence for them, and I reason based on that evidence, I'm likely to get them to turn toward me, hmm. or toward not just me, but toward where I'm taking them. Yeah, and uh and that in that where that i'm taking them is co-created with them by the way um uh so uh and so that, that's that's a hint about the available means of persuasion because sometimes you know if you if you get into an argument with someone and let's say you're leaving that argument you're driving somewhere and in your head you're like eloquently coming up with oh i should have said that and i should have said this and Oh my God, if they were just, <laughs> yes, you know, yes, but those yes. weren't available at the moment, you know? Yes. Uh, so the, the power to discern, to discover the available means of persuasion yes. 
uh, is a, is an amazing power. Um, and yeah. uh, and there's a there's you know again so much to it, but that's just to kind of like a, a little hint. Um, uh, I think a key sort of component of that I study, I would say in rhetoric is something called rhetorical intelligence. I call it rhetorical intelligence and some others do, but the Greek word for that is phronesis and it's P H R O N E S I S phronesis, which is sort of like a, or an older word for that would be metis M E T I S. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, it's sort of like a, like a, like a from the gut kind of, being able to be present to what's so and mm-hmm. acting without a certain rubric about how to act in a given moment. And in fact, if you do rely on a certain rubric that's generated from the past, you're doomed to failure. So it's, it, there's a certain sort of, uh, and this is also the doorway to, you know, what we would call uh, ontological inquiry as well. Yeah. So, okay. but phronesis is often translated as prudence or practical wisdom uh, which sort of sort of diminishes it, uh, yeah. I think, to like a thing that you could somehow, oh, I've got that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I get a very <laughs> different only, sense of, other than when the thing you just said from those words. Yeah, right. And it's only something that can be available in the moment of performance. Yeah, it's not something you could then once you've per- once it's performed, you don't own it. Yeah, it, yeah. It it it's you don't use it. It uses you, so to speak. Yeah. So. Uh, Anyway, lots of stuff there, but that's sort of what, uh, and I got, here's the thing, is that when I started this PhD program, I started to encounter discussions about this and was just blown away that I, in my work with, um, you know, the courses I took with Landmark and uh, I volunteered a lot with their programs and delivering their programs and actually leading some of their sort of uh, 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 first level, you know, like, like leading introductions to the forum, for instance, and that sort of stuff that I had undergone a pretty intensive rhetorical training that was just, uh, and I couldn't help myself from discovering, oh, wow, I could teach writing and I could use this maneuver and that maneuver. And it just sort of like happened. Like it wasn't even, I didn't even plan it. Yeah. And um and saw just great value for students uh in learning, you know, to become writers for the university. Um uh and then took to studying this as part of my dissertation. And yeah. uh and so um and during that time, during that writing of the my dissertation, we were taking courses and studying this and 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 discovering all kinds of interesting and amazing parallels in my field. Um I discovered a dissertation written by this man named Bruce Hyde okay. and it's called saying the clearing. And it was a, a Heideggerian study of the forum. This is before it was called the landmark forum. This is because it was in 1989. Uh, it was written. The actual dissertation is from 1990. And uh, I stayed up uh, the entire night reading. Uh, it was basically a 600 page dissertation. Mm-hmm. And it was just extraordinary. Um, and I totally, you know, my whole sort of future uh, as an academic unfolded for me in that moment. Hmm. And I got what I was to do uh, for my work, um, for my dissertation and beyond. Um, and um, I eventually contacted Bruce uh, and started a conversation with him. Uh, he became part of my dissertation committee. So I had faculty of my in my school, but he was an outside member of my dissertation committee and um, got wonderful, wonderful training and development through that relationship as a writer, as a thinker. And then after I got a job here in New Jersey at Rowan University, um, I said to Bruce, we need to write a book. Uh, I got a dissertation. You got a dissertation. <laughs> uh-huh. We should have a book. We need to do something. And and uh, I so I persuaded him, you know, and we got to work. Um, that started and we started our work in earnest in 2012, uh-huh. presented at the uh, communicate uh, conference, um, uh, the communication. Is it the oh, my God, the American Communication Association, I think. I have to look that up as it's not not when I normally attend. Uh-huh. Um and uh, but then we also got together and he was in Minnesota, I'm in New Jersey. And uh, we so we got together in Minnesota to work out a plan and um, came up with the, the, the basic design 
Um, uh, but based on Bruce's notes, so he attended a forum in 1989 and he was part of a, he, he was allowed to actually take notes and he took extraordinary notes, um, back and forth conversations, uh, between, you know, that were going on in the course itself across four days, you know, each day being in excess of, of, you know, 10 hours, uh, of dialogue, mm -hmm. uh, just amazing, you know, and um, and that was the notes that he used to develop his his uh, dissertation, which also included thinking through Heidegger and then uh, uh, connecting the two. Mm -hmm. And it was sort of his dissertation was was sort of a very close interweaving of what was going on in the room of the forum and Heidegger's responses to that, you know, like or his his Heideggerian responses to that, his way of reading that. And so what we decided was what we want to do is actually separate it out. So that we can have just a transcript of the forum itself, so that it can be experienced in its own light, mm -hmm. and then have these sidebar conversations uh, that along that happen alongside the transcript of the forum, and mm -hmm. also interval conversations that are more sort of thoughtful, heady kind of uh, Heideggerian lines of flight, yeah. um, in between breaks that happen during the natural course of the 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 actual yeah. form itself yeah. and um and it was around that time that we made a request to access the uh the original you know uh recording of the event um i was granted that went to to, to their archives and and was able to do to basically complete the transcript because it was already pretty good but there were all kinds of nooks and crannies that that i i as a as a historian you know for me it's crucial to include all those elements and so yeah. um the though i had limited time i did my best and 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 it's a pretty good transcript i'd say hmm. uh and um and now uh here we are well that was but we finished principal writing of the book in 2015 hmm. uh literally uh in early september was the last um the last work that Bruce was able to finish and uh, weeks uh, in October 13th of 2015, that's when he passed away. Um, he had a, re a, re a recurring cancer is what happened uh, yeah. for him. Yeah. And, um, and then it took uh, a couple of more years before it got published in 2019, but there was uh, some, some hoops to jump through there. But uh, um, now, uh that's a big part of my academic project and and uh, uh and now where i am is uh having also done in a parallel with that i also study um the controversies concerning rhetoric and philosophy um primarily between the you know the conversation between schopenhauer and nietzsche hmm. where uh schopenhauer is uh often read through the lens of Nietzsche because Nietzsche was one of Schopenhauer's uh, most famous followers who famously turned against Schopenhauer. Yeah. And what happened in his turning again against Schopenhauer is that a lot of his um a lot of how people approach Schopenhauer is through that lens of Nietzsche having turned away from Schopenhauer which then disguises or obscures the impact of Schopenhauer. Yeah. And so part of my project is sort of like pulling back that kind that veil, so to speak, and mm -hmm. looking at what Schopenhauer's contribution is, not mm -hmm. to philosophy. I'm looking at Schopenhauer's contribution to rhetoric. Rhetoric, yeah. <laughs> which, yeah. Which, 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 uh, by the way, Schopenhauer would probably likely not uh, not find to be his most valuable contribution. <laughs> huh. But to me, yeah, to me it is. Um, and um, and so so I'm actually working on now a two part project, two different books. Huh. One will be looking at this this uh, Schopenhauer's rhetoric, so to speak, um, and uh, which I, I would call a th like I'm going to provide a theory of what I call rhetorical figures of transformation. Yes. And uh, so but to be just to kind of give a again a little handle on things. A rhetorical figure is normally a rhetorical figure of speech yeah. or a rhetorical figure of thought. Yeah. A rhetorical figure of speech is um, most people think of, oh, you mean like a metaphor? Uh, 
kind of that's called a trope mm. a trope is when um a word or phrase usually but a word turns away from our expected the expected meaning that we have for that mm. um so uh you know so and we use metaphors uh, as tropes all the time you know where we say this is that mm-hmm. yeah. um you know, coffee is an elixir, you know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the life giving potent, you know, whatever. Um, and I'm already in that, in that realm, you know, twisting words or turning words in a new direction, that's but that's, I'm, mean, that's all good and fine, but that's not necessarily my focus. My focus is in rhetorical figures of speech and thought and a rhetorical figure of speech is a pattern of a sentence that itself is identifiable and it's an odd use of, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's an odd presentation of a pattern that that might strike us as as different than we expected. It's turning away from the ordinary way that we speak. Yeah. And and it and it draws attention to itself in a way that does something. Yeah. And sometimes the attention it draws is not overt. Like I don't actually notice when rhetorical figures of speech are being used. Yes. It's but it still affects me. Yeah. Now, a rhetorical figure of thought is uh is a little bit different. A rhetorical figure of thought is may employ figures of speech, mm-hmm. but the purpose of the rhetorical figure of thought is that it is is it performs some kind of a speech act. Mm-hmm. So a speech act is where um I say something like uh uh come with me for a walk. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, that 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 I I gotta now say something like, sure or wait, let me get my shoes on or, uh, so there's a response, mm-hmm. and and it, it involves a turning toward and it involves a a solicitation of the other to respond. You know, yeah. so there's a rhetorical figure of thought that's present. Yeah, um, and there are various uh, uh wonderful expressions of that that I could go into um but then there's something I would say that there's another dimension to both of those rhetorical figures of speech and thought which I call rhetorical figures of transformation mm-hmm. which is uh when a figure actually leaves both the speaker and the audience in a transformed state even if it's just for a moment mm-hmm. in the performance of the figure itself mm-hmm. and so so the book one so the first book project would be basically laying out the the theoretical underpinnings of this rhetorical figures of transformation. Mm-hmm. The second book project is uh would be kind of like a a little bit less academic and more for a popular audience that would focus on the uh a com- building a compendium of rhetorical figures of transformation using those that are present in the in the book speaking being and in other places uh, within the work of Werner Erhardt as a kind of a paradigmatic expression that employs these these kinds of figures yeah yeah and so that's the that's the long story i guess uh, to maybe i don't know 15 20 minute version yeah yeah this is great <laughs> of of um of the arc uh, yeah. and where i am right now yeah so also along those lines is the last little bit is that I've just recently launched an academic journal called Turning Toward Being, the Journal of Ontological Inquiry in Education. Yeah. And I have an article in the first issue, which came out this past July, um, uh, called Ontological Inquiry, the Absent Heart of the University, where I make a case sort of for the value of, of, of something called ontological inquiry, which is, I could say quite simply, it's the performance of rhetorical figures of transformation right. is a key component of ontological inquiry when it's affected, when it's effective. Yeah. The rhetorical, the, the, the rhetorical figures and speech of transformation is that um, when Warner talks about uh, making distinctions, and the way that he uses that, that term, is that, yeah, is just, that in the in the ballpark of in the direction of yeah, that? I would say, certainly yes. In fact, you know, so so this process or event, I'll say an event of distinguishing a distinction, mm-hmm. is uh, you know, again, it's it's bringing forth a distinction from nothing that then opens up a world, 
Yeah. For you and I to turn toward and be together in. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So certainly. Um, uh, and that's why, yeah, exactly. So, so any given sort of, uh, distinction so-called is, uh, is what I'm theorizing it as, as rhetorical figures of transformation is not just merely to rename it, but it's also to show that there's a relationship between the work that's done in something like the forum and what's uh, as an instance of the rhetorical tradition, that it's an expression of or participates in, has relationships to um, what's called the rhetorical tradition. But it's also a re redef not, not a redefinition, but a recasting of a whole new context to understand the rhetorical tradition. So mm -hmm. while it participates in the rhetorical tradition, it's also reframing the rhetorical tradition. It's mm -hmm. it's stepping further beyond it. And now the thing that that has been my life's quest is to reveal to my field, hey, there's this really interesting phenomenon going on over here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Y'all should check it out. If there's something yeah. really interesting that may that may impact yeah. our understanding and practice of rhetoric and the study of rhetoric and how we teach it and how we explore it, write about it and study it yeah. and all of the artifacts that we deal with in what's called, you know, rhetorical criticism or, yeah. or uh, yeah. So on and so forth. Yeah, totally. And there's just, um, well, a few, a few, a few things. Cause I kind of gather that you, you kind of have a, well, you have a vision I I'm hearing of, essentially showing or bringing um, ontological inquiry into your world, right? In education, yeah. learning, in uh -huh. universities, in academia. That's, yeah. I get the sense that that's like, but based on what you just said, but I also kind of feel that from you. Yes. Yes, yes. precisely. Yeah, that's it. You know, um, uh, so... So a big part of, I guess, you know, what it says my my vision, you know, it's it, the the uh, the possibility that I say that I am, like my word in the matter of my life is is uh is actually the possibility of speaking being, mm -hmm. you know, uh, which uh which is something that's kind of impossible. It's sort of a quixotic quest, you know, Don Quixote, you know, running with uh yeah. his um. Uh, you know, jousting with uh, windmills and whatnot, and so <laughs> yes, and uh, and that's who I am in the uh, in the academy in some ways. You know, there's a and I kind of joke about that because it's kind of fun, um, uh, because there are structures in place that that exist and persist due to um, uh, centuries of mm -hmm. educational practices that are sort of hard baked into. Um, into what's called education or the even you know higher education. Um, that are, uh, it's a modernist enlightenment enterprise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, which, which, uh, for, for better or worse, you know, it produces results. It, 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 it provides advances and progress and, and is, uh, is extraordinary, really amazing, uh, especially to the degree that it has, uh, freed most, uh, what we call the modern world from, the, the the sort of like the restrictions of a traditional worldview, which mm -hmm. uh, doesn't really permit the inclusion of experimentation of en yeah. encountering and direct you know with it with one's own eyes yeah. and discovering for oneself what's so and then being able to build from that and communicate it and and, and you know there's again extraordinary possibilities that are are given by the Enlightenment project, but at yeah. the same time. Um, there's something that was lost yeah. and it and what was lost is this access to being. Yeah. Um, and so Phil, you know, there's, there's, uh, certainly in, in various pockets, you know, there's conversations for the possibility of, of encountering being and, but how do we speak it? How do we actually point to it in a way that actually presence is being as a possibility, uh, you know, kind of who we are really. Mm -hmm. What is that? Mm -hmm. I can't know it because everything I know is already second hand. Yeah. It's yeah. already missing the picture, right? Oh, it's always a being, um, right? It's going to be yeah. whether it's representation or thing or, yeah. yeah. And it, 
And, and from a modernist point of view, it's completely useless. It's ridiculous to even ask that question. What are you doing? You know, <laughs> it makes no yeah. sense. Yeah. Um, let's get busy with producing results. Come on. You yeah. know, uh, things that can be used and put to use uh, in order to. Um, so uh, so that's part of the tr- the trouble that I'm, I've put myself in uh, is um, <laughs> is. Uh, doing that particular project is, is also against the, uh, against certain grains that I got to incorporate and deal with. And I'm kind of, again, I'm turning toward the modern and asking them, asking the modern to turn in this direction is very strange and very unfamiliar and, and doesn't look like it's very useful or meaningful or valuable at all at first. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, so I have a, a little bit of a joke that's in my, in my article in the, in the turning toward being journal uh about um so there's a night there's a 1950s uh looney tunes cartoon um called one froggy evening and if you if you were a fan of looney tunes as a child uh, of the 70s then you might recall uh, a construction worker dismantling a building and discovering a little cigar box that he opens up and then Michigan J Frog leaps out, you know, hello, my darling. Hello. He's singing a song with his top hat. And, and the guy just suddenly is like, oh my God, I can make so, tons of money if I just can put this to use. So it's like he discovers being. Yeah. He counters being. And then the first thought is I got to make money with this. And so he tries to then bring the singing from dancing frog to people that's, that can empower him to make money, Yeah, but nobody else can see it, but him. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. And, yeah. And uh, and, and so it doesn't work. He finally gives up and tucks it away uh, at the site where the new building's going up, which is dismantled in the next century by someone who's shooting like dis- disintegrating rays, finds the frog, and starts all over again. Yeah. Um, and it's a little bit of a joke, but at the same time, there's something very serious about that. Yeah. yeah. Um, but that given given the 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 worldview that we're sort of uh, 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 b- born into, or oh, the inherited being of human being, is uh, it can only take being and use it for something. Yeah. And yeah. so, so for me, you know, writing and teaching and doing what I'm doing is about just finding ways to playfully dismantle that. Yeah. So in a way, I get to play the role of the singing and dancing frog. Right. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Yeah. Because there's there's so, something about so it's like what I'm I think what I'm basically hearing is that you're talking about a uh a kind of awakening of a kind of knowing that is a is distinguishable from being it's transformed. Not epistemological knowing. It's not yeah. knowing about or, or knowing an object. Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of uh, unfortunate that we have this word knowing, you know, in in, uh, yeah. in English that can needs to be disambiguated, you know, like, uh, uh, but certainly, but it's yeah. something that is, um, and then f- it, what's interesting to me is that Schopenhauer does an amazing job of making this distinction. Hmm. Extraordinary. So he hmm. says, you know, the world, there's the world as will, and there's the world as representation. And both worlds are the same world, Mm -hmm. just from two totally different points of view. Mm -hmm. One, the world as representation is the world as we know it. But the world as will is the world as we will it or be it. Yeah. And that's just, I again, I'm just boiling it down to a simple statement, but there's so much more going on there. But that's just a little bit of a hint. Yeah. But he says, you know, the thing that he says is that, you know, like, for instance, you know, I, I can, you know, my body, for instance, mm-hmm. is just as much an object as all of the other objects spread out here in the world. And all of the objects are, are causally connected. Mm-hmm. There's nothing that happens without some cause for the change that produced the current status of a given object mm-hmm. in the world of objects that are all interconnected in, in, in the world as representation. However, I also have this amazing ability to be aware of internally what's going on with my body 
as my body's moving. So I can see mm-hmm. my hand moving. I could feel it moving, you know, but there's also this whole other kind of dimension that I'm aware of that that's clearly it's that it's not the same as my hand as an object among yeah. objects in the world. Yeah. So that's that's one way to get the difference between the world as representation and the world as will. So there's not that the world as will causes my movement. Yeah. My movement is part of the world as representation. It's like will translated into knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. like knowledge is like a light. The light just happens to shine on the movement and it renders it in a particular way. But the rendering of the world in the world as representation is completely, utterly different from the world as will. Mm-hmm. The world as will cannot be known. Mm-hmm. It's who and what you are, but you can't know it. Yeah, 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 <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, it's never, you can't, it, 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 it's never like an object that you can represent and as a subject. And Right, it, it's, but as it, soon as you do, as soon as you do, you are, it isn't it. Yeah, 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 yeah totally. The, the, so a, a number of things that as you're talking, I zeroed in on um, that I want to I, I want to kind of draw out a little bit more. Um, first was is just kind of your your own history when you talked about uh, there was a certain point where you talked about like then you went on your own search, right? When you got into into um, uh, Gurdjieff and all the stuff that you know, and then you then you went to the forum and then you actually, as you said, mm. you actually directly discovered stuff yeah, yeah encountered not just talked about the thing but actually encountered the thing um when that search in what sense like that desire or what you were desiring how did that get awakened in you the very inkling of the search right do you have a sense of what was the the yearning or the desire and how did that desire I I don't I mean I can't I I I'm pretty I could say that from early on I was a little I was always a little weird. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, and um, and so in the sense of I was I was kind of looking at things uh like, but not like a in a, in a it was it was a superficial kind of thing because I was just a kid you know growing up and. But I kind of always found myself kind of uh, going for certain things that were uh, just on the edge of what was considered um, uh, acceptable in terms of thinking and and believing. So, for instance, I was heavily into Dungeons and Dragons already when I was a 10 year old and um, and, and deep into sort of magic and arcane stuff and all that all the lore and. Yeah. And world of that mythology and and so whatever it just was kind of there and um but i also had an interest in you know being with regular people too <laughs> so so i had you know this this interesting dance and back and forth and and um and had numerous and you know kind of i'll say thoughtful intense encounters so I, it's not that the forum was my first real encounter i would say mm-hmm. um but i had uh conversation partners that allowed for you know, glimpses and discoveries. So I started reading Joseph Campbell before, um, well before that, yeah. and and Schopenhauer and that that sort of stuff. So I was already kind of like, uh, uh, you know, I had a friend, a very close friend who who's the one who introduced, um, who discovered the fourth way of Gurji first and then shared it with me. But while we were in our first year in college, we decided that we were going to leave college and go to India. And, you know, uh, we found, you know, Ram Dass's Be Here Now and and various other things. And we were like, oh, well, we're just going to leave here. We'll go and find a guru out there, you know, like that, that kind of business. So yeah. it didn't do, it didn't happen that way, but that's sort of the kind of uh, the antics that I was up to before that. So, you know, it was probably much, much, much longer in place, but I, I knew something, I knew something was there, Yeah, but I just didn't have access to it quite yet. Yeah. So until... you, yeah. So the, the little hints, the little hints could That's strike right. you. Yeah, they could strike you and yeah. orient you. And there was something about your particular unique twist towards the periphery. I was certainly listening for something. Yeah, I was yeah. listening for what I would say now is I, I was listening for ontological inquiry or or the, the realm of that. 
you know, I could detect it, so to yeah. speak. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but I didn't know I could detect it. It just was kind of like whenever it was present, I was gravitating toward, you know, in that direction. Yeah. So interesting. You talk about just like that you use the word listening, right? You were listening for, and it's, there's just something really profound or compelling to me about listening itself to think about what listening yeah. is, right? Absolutely. But, but especially that sense where you're talking about where in some way there's that, there's that way that we can, hear something and realize that I have been listening to like listening for it without ever recognizing it or it being any explicitness, having explicitness my whole life. But the moment right. I hear it, I'm, I simultaneously wake into that. It's like, I kind of think about it. It's like, as if there's a little guy in my head, right. You know, and I'm at a theme, a loud theme park, and then it's just out of the corner. Someone yells the, 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 my own name, and it's like mm. everything stops, like as if there's an the ear tuned into something. Yeah, that's really great. And um, I, I, I would say, you know, like one way to look at that that yeah. I find attractive, fascinating, yeah. is considering the possibility that who I am as word, like the word that I am mm -hmm. is ultimately something that cannot be said. Mm. And as unsaid, the word that I am is, has integrity. It's whole and complete, lacking no part, uh, sound and perfect condition, right? But as the fragment of that, that I am in my momentary moment by moment existence in life you know in time space and causality in the body you know like all this i'm uh only a mere expression of a piece of that yeah and in my knowing as a knowing being i'm kind of cut off from yeah who i am as that word yeah so to speak and so but i discover it from time to time and I'm just sort of saying what you're saying, but in a different, yeah. a different frame. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so that, in other words, that what if there's a word that you are, yeah. that you've been living from, that's been using you, not just you, by the way, yeah. but the entirety of the world and all of its relationships that you are a fragment of. Yeah. Yeah. Your whole life long, so to speak. So, oh my God, wait, what? You know? Uh, isn't that, you know, destiny or fate or that, you know, the bullshit having to do with that? And I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know if I would go that far to say that, but some people have. Um, and uh, and it's worth considering. Yeah. Um, because now I can look back, you know, you as, as a as a 52 year old, yeah. you know, I could look back at my life. Yeah. And I can see that all the stuff that appeared to lead up to doing the forum in 1992. And then all of the kinds of things that I did subsequent to that meeting Bruce right. going, you know, produce, you know, the book uh, speaking being, and now what I'm, you know, like all of it is sort of like, Oh my God, I can see that there's only like a word that's been, yeah. um, uh, I would say it's akin to like a, if you take a magnet and put a sheet of paper over it and sprinkle iron filings over the paper, yeah. it'll form yeah. a pattern. Yeah. And you yeah. peel that away and then put the paper back and then the spring, spring the sprinkle the iron filings again, it'll form the same exact pattern. Yeah. Uh, like that. And th this is, this is, uh, uh you know, uh, expressive also of, of Schopenhauer's mm. world as well. Mm. That there's a, that, that just as every, thing in the world let's say the beings of the world mm -hmm. uh have a side to them that can't be seen or known mm -hmm. uh so too do you mm -hmm. yes <laughs> yes just as much unknown to yourself you know i can't know what the thing in itself of you know uh you know this 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 bottle is and yeah. neither can i know or have direct access to what you are in yourself but i also don't have any access to who I am in myself, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, so, yes. so the, what, so one way to call that intelligible character, this is a Kantian term, mm -hmm. but you can kind of detect it. 
you and that that's what intelligible means they are not that you can know it but that you kind of can negatively know it meaning that everything you can walk right up to the very edge of its possibility and glimpse that there's nothing beyond you know beyond which you can't know you know you, can, you just can't know it but you can it's that that sort of points in the direction i call it i call that the, that event turning toward nothing yeah yeah yes you know or what what the pre-socratic philosopher parmenides would call the path of nothing <laughs> yes, yes which is which is impossible yeah but you can kind of get up to the edge of it yeah and um uh but what's there, you know, one 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 way to access, and this is what Heidegger does, is that he, I think, what he does, uh, if I could sort of nutshell it terribly, but nutshell it nonetheless, is that he invents ways to read words that point in that direction. So, like phusis mm-hmm. or logos, which is the word, you know, um, or, or aletheia or any of these other terms that he he plays with are mm-hmm. all different expressions of uh words that have emerged to name what can't be named yeah the yeah. intelligible character yeah which is another name for what can't be named yeah um and uh and so in any case uh on this side of paradise this side of nothing yeah we just got whatever life that you've lived that you can kind of gather together. Oh, you know, I can gather this and this and this and gather, you know, I'm using that word on purpose. Yeah. Um, and then you gather it into a whole. Yeah. And that's, that's what it is to honor one's life as one's word is you gather together all of the fragments yeah. into a whole. Yeah. And you, and you're not going to get, you can't ever reach the, full full integrity i would say yeah full whole and complete because there's always vagaries there's always constraints there's always just what it is to be in the world yeah yeah and that's just part of the that's part of the but that uh but that's where but the discovery of that is where restoration of of integrity is possible like in other words it's not possible for little old me but it is possible for who i am as the word that i am mm-hmm. yeah 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 that's that yeah. that that's what's animating my being in the world yeah yeah and i just i can't know it i can only sort of like i don't know give thanks to the word that i am because it's running the show and i'm i'm it's little i'm the little scotty dog in the monopoly game that it's playing yes <laughs> <laughs> right 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 Thanks for yes. rolling that 12 there, yes. you know, and yes. <laughs> oh shit, I got a two. Yes. <laughs> so, yes. Uh, landed on park place and someone else owns it. Shit. You know, right. like, is um, it, it's, it's actually really quick. Just the, the, our relationship to that, nothing. Right. Our. It's some, yeah. uh, you can't be related to nothing, but got it. Go yeah. Ahead. That realm that, that whatever we're pointing to there. Is the word, is it that there's another Heideggerian word, attunement? Like, is it, is, is that, is that, is that nothing that, that, that thing that distinctions and metaphors can give a hint towards, but can't directly say, um, orienting that way, is it, is that, is, is that orienting, I don't know, towards it or with it, um, is, is that an attuning or being a two well, okay. guy? Yeah. Well, okay. So yeah, there's, there's a, there's a lot of, um, um, a lot to unpack yeah. there. So one way to look at, um, there's actually, a, I, I, there's a, a wonderful sidebar a series of sidebars in, um, in day three of speaking being huh? that deal with, uh, mood and attunement and um a fun you know what what a, what's called a you know a fundamental attunement uh mm-hmm. for heidegger um but um but basically our access to attunement you know as a just a person in the world going around is something i call mood yeah you know we yeah. call that i'm in a mood 
you know, yeah. the mood is bigger than, than, than me. Yeah. And, uh, uh, which is really fascinating. It's like a fascinating thing to look at, to examine yeah. so that there's always, yeah. and, and the, the, the premise to start with is that there's always already a mood that I'm in. Yeah. And there's always already a understanding of the self and world. That's, that's that, that mood attunes us to. Mm -hmm. So, so for instance, as a simple example would be something like, let's say there's someone who is always already not being listened to waiting Mm -hmm. to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. yes. <laughs> and now, and now you could say maybe the mood that 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 that's there is some kind of you know a little bit of resignation, maybe some cynicism. Oh, nobody cares. Nobody's going to listen to me. You know that that would be an after effect of that. But that the lived experience for that person is that even if someone's actually listening to that person, yep. they experience not being listened to. Yes. Okay. Because that's, that's the attunement. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. now what Heidegger was looking at was was uh, special kinds of mood and attunements yeah. like fear. Yes. And so fear is uh or fright, you know, is involves that there's a there's a that which elicits fear in me. You know, there's got to be a fearful dangerous thing you know something that that uh puts into threat my existence about which i'm afraid and uh which is one sort of like cut at it but then a deeper cut would be getting to what he calls anxiety or angst which is not at all what our psychologized you know uh uh informed psychological self would say that anxiety is Anxiety is just sort of like, uh, you know, this sort of general mood of, of you know, uh, being anxious or something. Yeah. And I don't mean to demean that or diminish that at all. Yeah. But Heidegger was just talking about a very different phenomenon. Yeah. Um, and so so it's a kind of it's a kind of fundamental attunement anxiety that also is uh, similar to boredom, profound boredom or or astonishment ah oh, mm. in the uh these other kinds of 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 fundamental attunements that in the attunement what the corresponding or correlative understanding of self in the world is mm-hmm. is uh, is is of the nature of ontological encounter mm-hmm. or what mm-hmm. we might call ontological subjectivity mm-hmm. so right. so for for anxiety uh that is the encounter the full and unmitigated encounter with the nothing yeah and that there's no you anymore in that moment yeah there's no yeah. time even yeah. there's just nothing yes but not yeah. like a concept and not like about and not like oh my god i just encountered nothing no 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 yeah <laughs> it's yeah it's it's uh it's 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 being so alone that you don't exist anymore Yes. Yes. That kind of encounter with nothing. Yes. Okay. Yes. And that there's that there's there's a fundamental attunement that goes with that, but that's not the only attunement. Mm-hmm. So boredom would be another uh, profound boredom, and and some most of us have some taste of boredom, but that you know most most of us actually live an entire lifetime of boredom and don't even know it. Yes. Yes. We're, we're sort of swimming around in, in curious, uh, you know, distractions, you know, and, and and not even aware that we're we're caught up and stricken with uh, profound boredom, mm-hmm. which is, you know, we're waiting around for basically to, to die. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, yes. That's the profound. That's the profoundest level of boredom, right? That because that's what boredom is. You're tearing away the time yeah. between you know, where you are now and when some event's supposed to happen that suddenly will relieve your boredom. Mm -hmm. Um, But that's also a fundamental attunement for Heidegger that, that uh, I would say gives some kind of opening to ontological inquiry. Now, the thing is to make this important, you know, important case uh, clear, it's not like 
you know, let's go get fundamentally attuned to nothing now. You know, like it's not. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, or even, you know, like uh, even let's take a course. So we go through that, you know, it's not yeah. anything you in your life would really want to do. Yeah. Nobody wants that. Yeah. I mean, because what it is that you're saying you want is the dissolution of everything that you are. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, ah, uh, and that's why, you know, Nietzsche, Nietzsche even said, you know, I don't think the thing in itself is anything anyone really uh, should care about. Yeah. <laughs> like, with the, why, why do we even, you know, again, uh, it's not just useless, but it's also, um, uh, is a little bit like sandpaper to the values and the concerns and the cares of the everyday. And that's why, you know, when, when people suddenly do encounter it without any rhyme or reason, it just happens to them. It's earth shattering. It's life shattering. It's, it's, it's utterly destructive, you know, and that's why it's important to have a school, you know, a structure uh, where it's possible to have such an encounter, but then, cycle back and return to yeah um what it is to live in everyday life you know but then to have a practice that allows for the back and forth of that yeah is is part of what makes a school a school yeah totally and the i guess the sense the sense um well actually before before going into this there was another thing that really struck me right that Mm. first when you the way that you um towards the beginning of the conversation initially distinguished like the basic gist of rhetoric, right? I think you said it's a, it's a turning toward the other. Mm-hmm. Right? The, I really, and the f- other could be nothing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's so it's this turning toward, right? Right. But then what happens when the nothing is addressing you? Yes. When you yes. are the other to the nothing, yeah, like that's. I'm sorry, I, I, I you were asking something, and I. Well, I think you. just, I think I just appreciated in that moment. I, 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 I it, what kind of co- awakened for me when you said that was like, oh wow, this is rhetoric is really quite. It's what it's addressing is something really primordial, right? Yeah. Even yeah. it's like, um, I don't think I viewed rhetoric in my, you know, my unstudied understanding of rhetoric. I kind of, I think I just had a sense of like, yeah, it's something to do with, um convincing people of things and arguments and using language to da, 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 right. But I kind of got yeah. a, a, a much deeper sense of the deeper structure of it um, or the deeper structure that is pointing to this kind of turning toward the other. Cause also, I mean, I think about this, I have a two-year-old and I'm, I you just, that's what he's practicing doing all the time is this yeah. turning towards the other. And like, and then that thing that happens is fundamentally is what, when he says, I, it's going to be given by this kind of intersubjective, right? Yeah. The patterns of the, 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 the rhetorical figures that are already practiced in his community. Yeah. Is it him? Is it he or, or she or. He, yeah. What, yes. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm yeah. Sorry. sorry. I missed that. Yeah. He. Um, yeah. So even he, even the fact that he's a he. Yeah. is itself you know a rhetorical maneuver in language that already designs you know uh, a dimension of how he bees in the world as someone who knows something you know oh i'm an i i'm a he you know all the other stuff is all part of the process of of what it takes to turn towards the other one must become some uh, a one who can address the other to begin with yes yes so uh and uh, wherein you know you're always factically thrown mm-hmm. you know uh coming from a past yep. so to speak yeah that can't be erased yep okay so there's always like layers and layers and layers so that even as as I'm turning there's always turning like I'm dragging with me yes the the weight of 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 yes the causal network going stretching back to the big bang. <laughs> okay. Yes. Uh, hey, as, yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. Very cool. Very cool. So there's, so there's like this, so this primordial, there's this primordial sense that rhetoric is addressing 
and there's the turning toward, and then there's the there's the study of basically what goes on in this back and forth, right? And and in, in essentially like kind of looking at it, it seems like would you say is it is it all the action is happening there? All of the like, for example, the ontological inquiry, right? I would imagine is this kind of way where it's a particular way of turning towards the other, right? And participating in language, right? In such a way that it can, I get this sense of, it's like one of those things that the, the, the nothing, the, 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 the showing of being, um, the word that you are, mm-hmm. For it to show up for a second, right, and then leave you completely deconstructed for that moment, right? Um, that I get the sense of something like that is the part that you can't really do. It's a thing that happens. Is that fair to right. say? Yeah. Well, I mean, there's there's um, there's some element of doing, like yeah. in other words, that you know when I when I turn toward in moments certain moments where there's a turning toward being slash nothing yeah and and uh and where there's a discovery of yes my own meaningless or groundlessness to my existence right yeah but then the next moment there's the next moment like who and 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 in that moment, I say there's a saying, something gets languaged or brought into significance. Um, and and it looks a certain way because it's a fragmentary expression that can only be said in that moment. And uh uh and that's the doorway, oddly enough, to return. So it's sort of like mm. I go, you know, there's a going going in that direction and turning toward, but then there's a return. Yeah. And in the return, yeah. it's like like re uh recollecting, recollecting the baggage, so to speak, that I left behind in little parts. You know, I re-enter the world, so to speak. Yeah. And then uh, but the way that I've re-entered the world then provides an access to return back yeah. to some degree. Yeah. And that's the back and forth and back and forth of the turn the, the the dialogos, maybe you could say. It'd be a way yeah. to look at it like that. Yeah. Um so that there's these, uh, uh, but but the question is, you know, well, what am I doing? I'm, well, there's a kind of dance or play or yeah. um, uh, an engagement. You know, there's some kind of, it looks like there's some intention involved, but maybe it just looks like it. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if I'm not already that, why would I want to become that? Right. Right. Meaning, Okay, well, I'll try, but you know, I've I, I don't know about you, but you know, I have tried to become something that I just wasn't. Yeah. I've lived through that. Yeah. And and it didn't work out. Not and, and I got that that's not that yeah. <laughs> that isn't me. That isn't my expression. Yeah. That is not my self-expression. Yeah. There's so the maybe whatever is going on right now, this is the self-expression. This is what's being expressed. Yeah. Like this is it. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Um. And then, then the sense of doing something to get somewhere, right? Uh, dissolves. Yeah. I would say in, in moments like that. Yeah. Yeah. But if I'm ever doing something to, to in order to, that's a sign that, like, I, I'm, I'm like, I don't have that thing, and I'm going to try to get it. Yeah. Yeah. I, now I'm, it's, I'm not talking about like making money, you know? Yeah. yeah, of course. If I don't have money, I can do stuff to get money. Yeah. You know? Yes. Mm-hmm. But I'm talking about if I am not already being something and I want to go be it, like being happy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, or whatever, you know, that, 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 that would be a, a, like a instance of something. Cause that's a, that's a whole other order of things than, than anything in the world. Yeah. Yeah who i'm being so i i'm sorry it's a little bit of a long roundabout way to to respond to that huh? but it is uh but uh, to me as far as i've looked it's uh i can't really do much intentionally except for what i'm already doing yeah at a yeah. given moment right because right. what's having me do what i'm doing isn't me per yes. se 
Yes. It's something much bigger than me. Yes. And I'm, I'm in some ways, uh, serving that Mm -hmm. I am. I serve at the pleasure of the word that I've given myself to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What would you have me do word, you know, like that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's a little, little mystic, a little traditional, like a kind of like it has a little taste of that. Yeah. Um, uh, And, uh, but I think that there's something really profound uh, and, and, and that, to me, uh, gives a sense of meaning and significance that, um, again, in the world that I've I've come into or languaged or in, in, in been languaged to see, uh, that's one of the highest values for me that I can have. Mm. Is mm. you know, there's a sacrifice. So, you know, what do I what do I give up? You know, this thing I thought I was up to and I'm doing, when uh, when it's actually maybe in the way. Um, and I don't even know it. And, yeah. And how do I, re, re, you know, in terms of uh, little old me recognizing that and then giving up little old me's attachment to it so that something that would be a surprise uh, yeah. or something that might overthrow what a, my expectations were takes takes things in whatever direction they're going to go, which was already the direction I was going anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. But I just couldn't see it. Yes. Yes. So that's part of that exchange, the back and forth and the back and forth, you know? Right, right, right. I don't know. I I really don't know anything. Like, I I really don't. Yeah, yeah. None of us do, you know? (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) yeah. And again, that could be offensive to say that or to hear that even. Um, uh, But it's it's more, I I would say it's kind of like an illusion that it's, I have this sensation that I know something. But when I open my mouth and say something, uh, I don't know. Yeah. Like really, if I'm looking at the experience of it, I'm, you know, <laughs> yes. I'm, I'm, it seems more like I'm being spoken than I'm doing the speaking. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes. And there's Maybe something at my best about, moments. I'll say. But there's, there's something about this that I, this, this brings to mind something actually you wrote in, in that I'd love to read right now and point oh, to. Sure. Sure. Like, is, oh, great. My. Of course, my iPad stopped working. Um, hang on one second. Oh. Here, let's 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 just pause for one second. I'm going to put it on pause. Sure. Okay, so this is um, this is on page uh, one. Or, I'm sorry, four ten. Oh, oh, in speaking being. Yeah, speaking being. Oh, okay. Is it in the sidebar or in the transcript? It's a, it's, um, I have it on PDF. It's, um, well, what I mean is, um, I could, uh, if you want, I, I could share my screen. Okay. And I could actually yeah. share it. But you have to, you have to add, you have to make me, uh, okay. You have to make it for multiple people. Sure. Okay. So actually, let me just check. So this is, uh, I'm going to read from the drift. And I'm going to read uh, through his encounter yeah. with Heidegger's thinking. Earhart has said new specifications for the communication of his work became available. Ways to say things more pointedly, increasing the work's value to participants. The fundamental dynamic of Earhart's work, its all-encompassing generative distinction, has remained consistent since its inception as the S training and throughout its iteration as the forum. At the same time, new languagings have been added to its vocabulary, creating other paths into the generative distinction. But just as Heidegger's language evolved significantly over the course of his career, Erhard has consistently experimented with other new primordial metaphors. Experimentation is essential if such a methodology of language is to retain its generative power. An ontological distinction is communicated in the unspoken background as concepts are generated in the foreground of a conversation. But the distinction maintains its force only while those concepts are being generated. In this relevant passage, Heidegger distinguishes two ways in which beings, including ideas and concepts, can be brought to appear in the world. Yes, yeah, so you want to, to yeah, I'll just tell you what, what these two quotes. 
what struck yeah. me what struck what struck me about this right um yeah we, we can read that too but the, what, what's striking me about this is this creation of a distinction and this 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 way and it's kind of getting it at what we're talking about right now this way yeah. where we're actually using language right that can't say the thing that is to be heard right right this foreground background thing that's going on is um is this fascinating yeah you know it's uh if i could if you don't mind me saying so I'll stop sharing but I'll, I'll go back later but but uh there's a rhetorical figure of thought it's called marismos Marism. and there's various readings of what that means and what you're doing with it like like if you said like ladies and gentlemen that's a simple version of marismos where you're naming the parts that are gathered but in saying the parts the whole is presenced yeah yes yes okay? so so marismos is 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 a is is when you say you put into place all of the parts of something and in that in that placing of the parts together in whatever mm -hmm. arrangement the whole emerges the world in which all the things exist as things mm. gets presenced yeah and and so that's at the level of no that's there that's a rhetorical figure of speech you uh, more, more like thought but i could say but there's a way to cut at it where it's a rhetorical figure of transformation yeah the yeah. and one of the one of the funnest uh uh encounters um that i have with that is with uh there's this um wonderful maneuver in um in the forum and also introductions to the forum that's called what you don't know that you don't know mm. are you familiar with that yeah 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 totally and, and maybe yeah and it's real simple i could walk your audience through that real quick yeah. but if you could imagine if there's a circle and imagine that that circle contains within it all possible knowledge that you could know you know in the in the universe and how much of that do you know if it were represented as a pie slice of that circle would be a very, very, probably a super small sliver. But if you're generous, you know, just a pie slice that you could recognize as one. Mm -hmm. And that's what you know that you know, things that you know, and you know that you know those things. Mm -hmm. And then a larger pie slice would be likely, you know, the, if we follow the already the figures already been given to you, you already see it, you could see it coming, mm -hmm. but you might not you see it at a different level than you know it. So you actually already got it, but don't yeah. know it yet. Yeah. You, yes. In fact, you know, but you don't know that you know it. Yes. But the next step is there's things that you, that you don't know, but you know, you don't know those things. Yeah. And yeah. you can reckon, Oh, I don't know that over there. And if I really wanted to know what I could go find out about, it. I could go take a class. I could read something. I could do whatever I could do to gain that knowledge yeah. and make it part of what I know and what I know, know that I know. But then the rest of the pie is, is what you don't know and you don't know that you don't know those things. Mm -hmm. And that is the, that's the marismos is that, oh my God, wait, oh my God, there's some, there's, I, I can get that there's some dimension of my existence that I don't know. I can't know. Yeah. And I don't know that I don't know that. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> And, and it just so happens that it just happens to be who you are yeah. <laughs> and, and who, and what, what, what the hell's going on over there with other people and what the whole, what's the, the universe, yeah. everything. Yeah. And, um, yes. <laughs> and it's a wonderful like joke, but the right. thing is, uh, so that's a kind of, that's a version of that, you know, but that's everywhere. That's the thing that's so cool is, uh, about, uh, I think Werner Earhart's, uh, I say rhetorical genius is, to find ways to keep saying that over and over and over and over and over again. Yeah. Every single moment of the delivery of whatever is getting done in, in a given expression of it. Yeah. And that's the art that that's the word that he is, so to speak. Yeah. But it's, um, and that's what I'm, you know, what I've always been, uh, uh, would say fascinated to study and to communicate that mm -hmm. and not to, you know, because Werner, you know, that's the thing, the, the, the danger here is that Werner Earhart is not necessarily special. Mm -hmm. And in, uh, uh, and I think that he, I think I would say as a person, he would likely uh, have some, some alignment with this, mm -hmm. that uh, each of us as a human being, what's possible is 
access to the very same realm uh, of ontological subjectivity that uh, his work is designed to gain, uh, to grant access to yeah. in performing yeah. it. And yeah. so and that's sort of the thing is that he was able to sort of like, he's like a Johnny Appleseed of transformation. Like here, just everyone can do it, you know, or uh, Ratatouille, you know, the movie where everyone can cook, you know, anyone can cook. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And some people yes. don't like that. They're pissed off at that. Like, well, no, not everyone can cook. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> my cosmic specialness right yes <laughs> yes um and uh uh and that's sort of the that is a sort of like the the radical democratic vision of of rhetoric as well is that nobody has any kind of real estate in the realm of nothing and being it's it's everywhere and nowhere yeah yes yes what is, nicholas of kusa said something like uh that God is a circle whose circumference is nowhere and whose center is everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. This is, there's a, just a sense of, um, uh, I mean, I, I love, I love the apophatic, like the apophatic, um, part of Christian mysticism and Zen and the, all these things that in some, they're not, um, well, I'll ask you about this. I, they're not like the same thing exactly, but they're, they're hinting at the same thing, this way of like pointing to what you, yeah. 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 Um, uh, yeah there is actually a sidebar in the book called the same, um, which is uh, to look at it as a distinction, you know, yeah. that there's uh, you know, cause nothing is, is incredibly unique. Yeah. You know, it's so unique that whenever it occurs, it's always the same. <laughs> yeah. yes know, yes it can't there's nothing but there's but it's not identical it's not similar to anything because it's always itself nothing yeah. yeah um uh now i think you know you know aldous huxley's uh the perennial philosophy might sort of point to this that there's ways in which he doesn't call it ontological inquiry uh but that's what i would say the perennial philosophy is pointing to is this encounter with the nothing that gets expressed, brought to language in various schools, or or uh, whether it's religion or art or or uh, state or culture or whatever, they're all expressions of or bringing to language and culture encounters with um, the nothing. You know what nothing, uh, which is available, though not accessible. It's available, but at the same time, not easily accessible. That would be the thing to say. Yeah. Yeah. Because we're not, we're not turned in that direction. Yeah. 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 In fact, it seems, it seems like a lot of the, in the, in the, in the, you know, reading the dialogue, right. That Warner was having with the participants. It seems like a lot of it is actually the thing that is said is somehow revealing that you weren't toward you like you were thrown into not being to turned towards it. And, and you didn't totally realize that you were so identified with it. And then there's like this moment of these little moments where like their identity shatters. Right. And there's this kind of opening, you know, and, and Warner's just hammering and deconstructing this, this sense of um, this sense of, of they self recognizing yeah. their inauthenticity is somehow mm -hmm. glimmers, glimmers of authenticity or something kind of come through that, right? This, right. this sense of yeah. the encounter is seeing that seeing that you haven't been seeing, right? He hearing right. that you haven't been listening, right? Which which can be astonishing. Yeah. And and it also could be boring or it could be anxiety producing, you know, like you know, yeah. In terms of shifting the attunement, um, yeah. uh, so to speak. Um, well, that's where, and that's kind of where, yeah, where, where the conversation is coming from. And, uh, uh, and, you know, there's, it's, a uh, it's interesting, you know, you think about like, um, you know, the emergence of the S training, you know, in the, in the early seventies and, you know, the, the narrative of course is that Werner had this experience that then he communicated to people and then, people shared it and then next but the thing is is that um inevitably you know even though the human potential movement was 
afoot. You know, that was sort of like the the atmosphere in which the S training emerged. And the S training has been understood to be an expression of the human potential movement. Um, it's actually a denial of the human potential movement. Yeah. But that didn't stop people from paying money to go do the course, thinking that it was going to increase their potential. Mm -hmm. And in mm -hmm. fact, that so even though it's said from the front, you know, you're you're going to get nothing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> People yeah. still were interested, you know, that that what had them do it was, oh, I want better relationships, or I want to be able to do what I really love in my life, or et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, that that was the that that was the selling point, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Um, and so uh. You know it, that it's just it's just this amazing uh, contradiction that yeah. um, is often overlooked. I think. Yeah, yeah, and that, and just that sense of yeah, this this. Um, actually, maybe we could pull it up again and read these read the quotes underneath these. These are really neat too. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh huh. Love to. This is what I. So yeah, just uh, I. Um, for your audience as well as I do um, have groups of people that um, have, I've got a one group that have, have been reading the book. We're about to finish reading the book for a third time. And mm. we've been reading the book together uh, every Monday night, uh, mostly every Monday night mm. uh, since spring of 2020 uh, during the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and uh uh, so I, I I do have a lot of enjoyment uh, with just sitting around with people and we read together. That's right. In any case, so uh, in his in this relevant passage, Heidegger distinguishes two ways in which beings, including ideas and concepts, can be brought to appear in the world. Considered in terms of the essence of space, the difference between the two types of appearing is this appearing in the first in authentic sense as the gathered bringing itself to stand takes space in it first conquers space as standing there it creates space for itself it brings about everything that belongs to it while it itself is not imitated so i'm, I'm present to here to to word as whole and complete hmm. and it doesn't in some sense you could say it doesn't care you know uh but it does provide you know everything that happens happens in its in the space that it conquers yeah yeah okay yeah. and uh there's a there's a way that 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 heidegger the d languages logos as gathering yeah you know or collected, you know, collected co collectedness, you know, but to think of a collection or a gathering yeah. is um, when you take a bunch of fragments and put them all together into a whole. That is restoring integrity, bringing the word into its own. Yes. So uh, in any case, appearing in the second sense merely steps forth from an already prepared space it's sort of like this side of yeah. the word you know yeah. in the and it is viewed by a looking at within the already fixed dimensions of the space the aspect offered by the thing the aspect is the appearance you know the the point of view um the aspect offered by the thing that and no longer and no longer the thing itself now becomes what is decisive. Hmm. Hmm. Appearing in the first sense rips space open. Hmm. Appearing in the second sense simply gives space an outline and measures the space that has been opened up. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, let's yeah, let's let's keep reading. This is this is the yeah, sure sure yeah. In the initial saying of a primordial metaphor, then, the space of a distinction is ripped open. Yeah. Subsequently, with each new and ontologically consonant languaging of that distinction, or with each reiteration of the dialogic unfolding of the series of hints, the space that has been created expands. Yes. But this demands that the space be opened newly in each occurrence. Earhart is emphatic on this point. I never repeat material. 
he told an audience in 1989. And I mean that quite literally. Every time I deal with something, I deal with it anew, like something to make present between you and me. Yeah. Two categories of distinctions are suggested by the two guiding questions of the forum. The first category includes our current but concealed ways of being human, our blind spots. Mm -hmm. These are the things about ourselves and our behavior that we don't know, that we don't know. Oh, how perfect that we said saying that here, which emerge within the question, what is the being of human beings? You know, what have we, what is the inherited always already being of human beings? Mm-hmm. And the second category are the new possibilities of being, which can be distinguished only when the blind spots have been discovered and chosen and the background of meaninglessness revealed as it is within the question, what is the possibility of being for human beings? Yeah. 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 So this, this, um, well, like may, maybe so we can kind of talk, can you talk about what, what a primordial, was it a primordial metaphor? Uh-huh. What is that? Oh, yeah. What are you pointing to? When I was saying before, I was mentioning this before when, you know, that Heidegger, you know, takes words like aletheia or phusis or logos Mm -hmm. and uh and you know there's there's a in the in the languaging of the word something unsaid gets presenced yes okay um but but you know it's and it's always a it's always has a metaphorical relationship meaning that you're naming something that cannot be named which is kind of the function of a metaphor. It's actually a special kind of metaphor called catacresis. Catacresis yeah. is when it's like an abuse, yes. like an abusive use of a word. Like, like you can't name that. And yeah, yeah well, here I am. I'm doing it anyway. <laughs> so, yes. And, uh, and so that's a, and, and so the primordial metaphor is uh, a metaphor that evokes this primordial encounter with the nothing. Yeah. Yeah. That's that that would be one way to look at, at what it is. But even by naming it and saying it, I'm I've we've lost it. Yeah. Yes. And that's yeah. the thing to always keep and keep in check. You're like, oh, you know, just because I name something and you might even have an idea like, oh, I know what he's talking about. No, you don't. Mm-hmm. I don't. Mm-hmm. But uh, <laughs> yeah. yes, yes. Uh, because because you're referring to some memory that you have about something that you think you experienced or whatever and that that all isn't it that's not ripping space open that's just yeah. you know operating in space that's already been created yeah yeah that you're in, that you're in the wake of yeah we are downstream from that yeah so so the primordial metaphor when of mm-hmm. when 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 in action when performed as a rhetorical figure of transformation evokes uh this or this turn toward nothing this turn toward being um and it's inevitable return hopefully yeah yeah but there are schools that are not about returning at all right the hinayana buddhism you know just no i'm gone forever see ya bye <laughs> don't wait for me you know like <laughs> right I think my as I, as as I encounter that nothing i'm yeah. never coming back you know like that's yeah. the uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally, totally, and even the, the the Tibetan Book of the Dead. I get the sense it's like this, this, um, this. You don't you don't get to the next realm until like you can stand between the most beautiful thing and the most horrific thing, and still just be totally equanimous, right? This mm-hmm. holding of this this holding of um, mm. this holding of this thing that you can't say. It's like that's the that's the measure of this, you know. Can you mm-hmm. see sanyata, right? And, and stay being sanyata, right? In the face of the most horrific and the most beautiful, right? Mm-hmm. That quality yeah. to it. So right. there's so there's like um, a sense where, I mean, has it been your experience, right? In, in writing about this and, and dialoguing about this and being oriented to it and taking the courses that you've taken and leading, leading the things that you've, you've led. Like in terms of your, again, it's like words break down, but your relationship to that inexhaustible 
fount of unrepresentable intelligibility, right? That 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 um, that that nothing is like over time. Have you noticed like your relationship to that or orientation towards it, right? Like, what has it become for you? Is it, is it, has it grown? Has, do you feel more over time? Is there a set, is there a sense of you feel more um, open to the hints? Like there's a sense of. Yeah. I, that, 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 this is sort of, um, cause you're asking the question that you're asking is kind of about progress yes yeah you know, and 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 in so in this sense in this particular sense i'm an anti i'm anti-progressive mm -hmm. um uh in the sense that um uh not not that i'm opposed to it it's more like i'm a progressive i'll say yeah. like a is the privative and you know, yes like, yes uh, um meaning that uh that it's not there's no ladder of of improvement yeah 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 it just is or isn't yes and that's and that's it and yeah. i and i i think that that part of the uh what i i kind of am attuned to is is again whenever that comes up and there's space and i'm in a particular space that allows me to i'll my role is to dismantle the drive to improve yeah um, yeah and yes. and that's sort of um and i'm a bit of a i will say i could say you know kind of uh tongue-in-cheek that i'm a bit of a purist around that that yeah. that um that i think that for instance warner you know the warner's work you know at its at its core is uh is and why it's it's a kind of um contradictory is that it's it's it, it is d dismantling of the drive to be more better and different yes yes and yet that's the thing is that like i said before is that what people do with it is that they 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 convert it into how it's going to make them more better and different yes because that's what what it is to be a modernist is yeah. is that we are you know um uh the the sense of the being that we that that we the beings that we are are uh to always be dismantling superstitions discovering the truth and living a new better life um with better gadgets you know <laughs> yes <laughs> and um yes. better tools and yes. and now i can conquer that thing i couldn't conquer before now i'm a better person and and um where whereas what i i would say what i'm studying what i'm yeah. dwelling in yeah is that it's this is it already mm -hmm in whatever form it is taking at this moment and mm -hmm. there's nowhere else to go. Yeah. Uh, and this is as good as I'm going to get and I'm never going to make it. Yeah. So to speak. Yeah. Which yeah. is, which might sound nihilistic or, you know, no, no, it's actually life giving. Yeah. Uh, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's actually bringing and discovering. That's, That's what I'm asking about is when you say life giving, right. That is, that sense of that sense of its life giving, I think is I think that is really more my question of like, uh huh, uh -huh. yeah. Well, I mean, I don't know life life giving like as in life opening like uh um uh and it just is just being it's the opening to whatever happens to be present right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. It, including the moments when i'm stuck or or unhappy or in pain or with a heart flutter or you know <laughs> yeah. whatever whatever it is um uh you know because um yeah the drive you know because the drive to be more more better different presupposes that there's some fundamental imperfection and there's something wrong uh and that um somehow it must be fixed and this is how and we're somehow you know we we kind of as good modernists we 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 emerge into the world with some sort of uh design that we 
draw from our culture. It's like cut from the cloth of our culture of what strategies we have to get to correct the wrong of our life, whatever yeah. that is. Yeah. I'm going to be funny. I'm going to be, you know, bubbly. I'm going to be, you know, uh, seductive. I'm going to be really smart and intelligent. I'm going to be some other way. Um, and then, but the, but that is itself already pl- placing us on the hamster wheel of, of endless improvement. Yes. Yes. And, and awakening to that, I think for me is thrilling. Like, wow. Oh my God. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yes. And, uh, uh, and, and that's that, that's my sort of attunement about it is, is just yeah. the joy and the zeal of constantly discovering that with other people. Yeah. And, uh, and some people dig that. And a lot of people, and there's people who don't, you know, like, no, I want to get more, better, different. Stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> get away from yes. me. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. That, that, um, that ecstasis, that ecstaticness, right. That you feel right. That you just met, you mentioned that kind of the, the thrill, the thrillingness of getting that right, over, right, and over right. and over again. Right. Um, the question is the is there what is the and this is this has been a question of mine like this is a mystery to me too is like because i've noticed that when when i when i have insights right at this level right about myself and i've watched other people have like insights about you know that kind of open up these these this this kind of dimension um they're usually insights that are just at a content level or horrific, right? They're like ones of like, I had no idea. I was turning the whole world into my mother all the time, right? I've, oh my God, I've right. been pretending my entire life, right? At some level, like, like you start to, like, you, these, it's kind of news from the universe, right? You, it's, it's, if you were just to read it, it'd be like, it's like not good news. However, there's a mood that is evoked in that that is, ecstatic there's these moments or often anyways there's these moments of Mm -hmm. thrill of and i've always wondered what what is what is that um that like even when you're getting bad news or you're you're being shown your limitations what is the the ecstasy the release the the thing that feels thrilling what what is that pointing to or what is that sometimes it's because it but let me just be clear because the, th- the thrilling is just an accident, you know, because uh, for others, it could be, you know, devastating. It could be, you know, st- uh, saddening. It could be, you know, uh, there's lots of different moods that could be associated with those yeah. kinds of discoveries, depending on, you know, um, uh, I don't know, again, again, the, the cards that that we've been each dealt, so to speak, you yeah. know. And I guess I, I'm lucky in that I have this uh, this knack to be thrilled at uh, dismantling the self, you yes. know, like, <laughs> yes, but that's not, that's just, you know, but then, uh, but if I were to like say or try to pinpoint, you know, well, what is that? I mean, it's some version of uh, the reduction of significance or you know, the bringing of some kind of uh discovery of the groundlessness of something yeah because because if i can see that there's that the significance is conditional Mm -hmm. and meaning that whatever that there's an i that's that exists only in relationship to the persistence of a certain significance Mm -hmm. and if that significance is undermined and revealed to be empty and groundless then the i that goes along with that is also swept yeah. away or yes. there, there's like a moment of sort of disintegration yeah and 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 there's also another a moment of being given by something bigger than that that yeah. isn't an eye or an object yeah a sub you know subject and object say let, let's say um and and yet it is what you are really even though you can't know it mm-hmm. You know, because knowing is always where things split into subjects and uh, subject and object, you know, because you can't have knowing something without a subject knowing it. Yeah. Um, But and that's sort of where we where I as an identity always already exist is in this in this relationship of subjects and objects. 
Yeah. And, um, and so, um, and so seeing that from time to time, you know, getting it at, at, you know, basically entering into the realm of, of ontological subjectivity, if we want to call it that, um, uh, you know, hearing the frog sing, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. seeing it dance, yeah. um, uh, you know, there's all kinds of other things that are also involved with that, that are, you know, not just the, the, uh, say thrill, but also the, um, that in, in communicating it, it's, it's hard work. It's actually, and, 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 and there's trouble involved. There's, uh, sacrifices and you know all the kinds of things that go along with just being in the world with others you know uh so uh, i'm just trying to i I don't really i don't really kind of like it's a little bit of a trick question not that you meant it that way Mm -hmm. because um because again any any kind of response that is in any way pretending to be an answer is itself um uh uh, in need of dismantling itself. So as long as it's clear, you know, that, you know, cause you could say like a formula. Yeah. Well, just, yeah. you know, if you can be in the presence of uh, the emptiness and meaninglessness of significance so that you're the, the self that you have taken yourself to be undergoes a, a, a dismantling, whatever that experience is, is always going to be interpreted after the fact as something mm-hmm. that never can reach what actually really is happening in that moment yeah yeah because it's already lost the moment when you're telling a story about it yes it's yeah. already become you know like a little nugget in a chest of enlightenment experiences that every once in a while you can open it and say oh yeah i remember that moment of enlightenment yeah. you know, that was really yeah. really great oh yeah. yeah what about that one? Oh yeah that was good too you know like <laughs> and, yes and, yes, <laughs> yes. Um, which which are which are uh, all of them are weights that keep us from uncovering this moment. Yeah. As the moment to be in. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And it's not better or worse to be one or the other, by the way, either. It's just. Right. You're on when you, you're, you are when you are and you aren't when you aren't. Yes. 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 And they can't. Yeah. Yes. And then don't, don't, just don't do what you don't, just don't, don't do what you're not doing. Right. Uh, (laughs) Right. Yeah. uh, It's it's a wonderism. Yeah. Yes. Totally. Totally. So there's, and maybe this is more, we can get into another conversation. I have to, I have to start, start to wind this down, but yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the sense about like, you know, it's, this is, it's really hard to put this. I think what I'm, I'm feeling into with this into words Right. I think maybe what I'm, I think what I'm kind of getting at is this, it's like, what is it? It's like the thing that calls, is it one, is it like in, in, in philosophy, they talk about like the, the philosophy arises out of the, out of the mood of wonder, right. About this, Mm -hmm. this sense of, that's what I always like, this is why on, on some level I'm reading your book and I read all the books and on some level there's this, it's articulating, it's pointing to, right, things that have me be in wonder about it. And in some sense, mm. the wonder feels like it's revealed, right, in some way. It's like, that's always this, and I think there's something in the book you talk about this as well, of like, where it's like the, the you didn't know that you didn't know, right? So there's like, whoa, right, that domain. But then there's this other element where it's like it feels like you're also remembering something, right? And I think you talk about it in the in the book of like um, um, you don't use the word memory, but there's a sense there's a sense that that it's as it's it's been that way the whole time, right? And it right. had right. it was just covered over, right? Yeah, that yeah. sense of strange, bizarre sense of familiarity that well, kind Alethe- of- yeah, because Aletheia, uh, the Greek, um, it's a wonderful word. Um, but if you're familiar with Greek mythology, then you know that the river Leith is the river of forgetfulness. So that when you, when people, uh, pass and go into the other world, you know, they cross the Leith and they're dipped there so that they forget their past life and they move on. But, uh, the, uh, in front of, uh, Lethia is privative meaning. So, 
one translation is just to, oh, it's to unforget. Yeah. Right. Yes. And and that's a word for truth that Heidegger distinguishes, uh, uh, distinct from our sense of truth or modernist sense of truth, where you know you have a statement that either corresponds to the state of affairs in the world or it doesn't, and that determines whether it's a true statement or a false statement. Yeah. But that's not truth in the terms of of Aletheia. Right. But there is another sense of uh, and uh, of of truth as the truth of being. Let's say what's so, like yeah. what's actually so, yeah. what's there, what is or what's here, there. Um, uh, there's there's just the truth of that. Be prior to us making evaluative statements about it, which yes. then can be measured of you know, as true or false. And then there's the truth of of the what's you know, what we could say is the throne open clearing the nothing, you know, empty and meaningless, you know, uh, uh, and also that it's empty and meaningless that it's empty and meaningless, mm -hmm. like that's the that's 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 Aletheia in the primordial sense of the encounter with the nothing, right? So, um, uh, no, I just I kind of lost for a second where uh, what you what you had just asked. The sense, we, of, well, speaking to the sense of wonder, right? Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that even in some sense calls, like calls you to write, calls me to read, right? That, that. Right, that well, that, like like we're being given, yeah, that, that we're being used by that. Yes. That, that yes. whatever that is, whatever you're calling, you know, whatever you want to call it. Um, and I would, you know, like, I think it's it's convenient and works for me to call it the word that I am. Right. If I'm a person of my word, you know, the one thing I can say is what my word is. Yeah. And and uh, but at any given moment, you know, whatever I say that my word is could also not be precisely what uh, what the word is that's giving my life. But it, it it's it provides a window for me to recollect it. Hmm. Right. Hmm. That which is not memory. It's yeah. more like. Yeah. I, that's why I said before it's like it's like restoring Story. words. Yeah, yeah. Restoring, like bringing wholeness and completeness, which is the wholeness and completeness of the word is always already there. Yeah, so to speak, it's not yeah. in time or space. Yeah, yeah. and yet my only, ex uh, my, but my experience as a me in the world is always uh, downstream from that, which means I'm always breaking my word. Yeah. I can't, I cannot, if I'm really honest with myself, I cannot, I can never keep my word. Yeah. I can always restore it though. Right. Word, right. Yeah. Right. Word is because it's because the recognition, oh, I can't keep my word is itself yeah. the beginning of restoration. Yeah. That's yeah. the recollection. That's the Aletheia, the moment of Aletheia. Yeah. That, yeah. you know, oh my God, I'm an asshole in my life. Yeah. You know, da, 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 whatever those the yeah. insights are yeah is that that moment of restoration of word yeah or or being authentic about one's inauthenticity you know yeah. being one yeah. way and presenting oneself as another and the that that you know i can't help but be that hmm. every single moment of my life is i'm out of integrity and inauthentic yeah <laughs> and and i can't be and we and, and and most people live like oh of course I'm I have integrity you know I'm authentic no you're you know but that's like okay I'll yeah. go along with you for a little yeah. while <laughs> yeah yes but, the, the, but the truth is yes yes the truth you know as at the level of Aletheia is is um is that I'm utterly lost and I have no bearings and I don't know what the hell I'm doing you yeah. know yeah I pretend that I do I pretend all the time I'm really good at it. Yes. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but um, <clears throat> so but I'm speaking again, looking at uh, the again coming back to that whole thing about being the Scotty dog in the Monopoly game. You know that mm -hmm. it's that that recognition that there's something bigger than what I have the that the beyond the horizon of my own individual consciousness can even fathom. Yeah. And somehow. Whatever that is, is uh, is giving life 
and I happen to show up in that. Yeah. Yes. And that's, that's as far as I can get. Yeah. 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 That's a, as an this, this is, this is a really good place to, 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 to complete, I think. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. It's been a really awesome, really awesome dialogue. I really appreciate you being on coming on. Yeah. Thanks guy. Thanks for, for the, uh, the, the honor of uh, being included in the conversation. So, totally. and I'll Very get good. all the relevant links that for people, for people, if they want to dive deeper into your work and I'll put it in the show notes under, underneath, underneath. The okay. Video. And I'll get that from me over your over email. Oh, okay. Yeah. So just like, uh, yeah, I guess we can talk about that after.